in the kids' message, I should have brought some goggles for my science experiment. Welcome out there <laughs> that you're watching. Make sure you type out where you're watching from so that we can acknowledge your viewership. Good to see you. We're going to start with the opening prayer. So will you pray with me? Come, let us delight in the law of the Lord. Our joy is found in the love of God and neighbor. Come, let us be nourished by the living water. Together we will worship the one who enables us to thrive. Amen. All right, let's stand and sing. <laughs> and why God decided to show himself in three persons. Father, the creator, Jesus, the savior, son, and the Holy Spirit. Yes, the comforter, the helper, the one that leads us to all truth, the one that is with us. So let's say that this vase, this vase, you can call it a vase, you can call it a vase, a vase. Say vase with me, ready? Vase. Okay, you can call it a vase or a vase, okay? And let's say it represents someone who doesn't know God, doesn't have a relationship with God. So the way that the spirit comes into the heart of a person is by, does anybody know? Kids, do you know how you get the Holy Spirit in you? Because the Holy Spirit lives in us, because he's a helper. He's gotta be able to tell us what to do and prompt us where to go and what not to do, right? So how do we get that Holy Spirit? Lucas. Pray to God, yes, and believe in Jesus, right? That's all it says. That's what Jesus said. Believe in me and what I've done, and the Holy Spirit comes yeah. in you. So let's say that this vase 
or Vaz, represents someone who doesn't know God. But they go ahead and they pray that they want to know God and they want and they believe in what Jesus did on the cross, and all of a sudden they are filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm afraid. that we are instantly filled with the Holy Spirit. And so our bodies are a temple because they are holy and we are filled with the Spirit of God. And so we can pray to God, we can pray to Jesus, and we can pray to the Holy Spirit. You can start your prayer out any of those ways because you're all praying to God. So isn't that cool? So know that the Holy Spirit lives in you. And if you have a really hard time about making a decision, pray to the Holy Spirit to guide you and to open a door for you to put you in the right direction because the Spirit of God is the wisdom and knowledge of God will lead us to all truth. So that's a wonderful thing. I just am afraid it's not going to stay like that. And I'm going to be doing my sermon and it's going to go. <laughs> just set it, set it over there by Brian. You see what it's doing. Thank you, Steve. All right, let's pray for these kids and then they can head on down to Sunday school. Lord, we do thank you for reminding us that when we first believed in you, we are filled with the Holy Spirit. Boom, full. Not just part way, not just a little way, but full, completely full. And so that's why Paul, the apostle, says that we are temples filled with the Spirit of God. So, um, Lord, help us to pray to your Spirit more, to pray, Spirit, to you, to guide us and direct us to look more like Jesus. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, so kidlets can head on downstairs if you want. Kindergarten through sixth grade, head on down. I'd get out while I could, unless you want to listen to me. <laughs> Some of you guys are going to tough it out, eh? Okay. Scripture reading today comes from the book of Peter. You know, we were talking in Tuesday Bible study, and we were talking about the apostles, um, the original 12 disciples. And um, I asked if they thought that the congregation would like to do a sermon series on the 12 apostles. Because how many believe Mark was an apostle? Oh, you guys are good. He was not, was he? Guess who did he tell most of his stories? When he wrote the Gospel of Mark, who was he telling most of his stories about? Which apostle? Anybody know? So that's what we're going to talk about. You know, and we're going to talk about the original 12, and then we're going to talk about the Gospel writers and who they were actually, who they were actually with, who they were on missionary trips with, and who they were actually getting their information from. So, because Mark would have been like maybe 10, 11, you know, when Jesus, um, the resurrected Jesus walked the earth. So, interesting. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So I'll probably do that after Easter. But our scripture reading today comes from 1 Peter, speaking of one of the apostles. Chapter 1, verses 14 through 16. Peter writes, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. This is the word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So I wanted to let you know that um, I am holy. <laughs> no, I didn't say my name was holy or holly. I said I am holy, okay? So when I got up this morning, my hair was all freaky and I have a big thick coat bottle of glasses on because I am blind. I'm really blind. I mean, I can't see without my glasses or my contacts. I was still holy. When I walked to the coffee cup in the morning hoping nobody would speak to me until I reached the cup and poured that coffee and took a sip, I was still holy. 
Oh, when I thought about how I was going to cover these wrinkles and these black under my eyes when I looked in the mirror and went, oh my gosh, what am I going to do with that? I was so holy. When I got in my car and I was headed to church and I accidentally pulled out in front of somebody and they laid on the horn, I was still holy. When I go up into town and I cut somebody off and I'm like, oh, and I lay on the horn for them or they cut me off, I was still holy. If I swore, I would still be holy. Did you know that? How many of you out there think you're holy? Raise your hand if you think you're holy. Okay, 10 of you. Well, bummer for you because I am holy. I didn't say I was holier than thou. I said I'm holy. Did you raise your hand if you were holy? I'm taking on it. She's, she's a, 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 I'm just going to type. I'm just going to play the piano. So you're probably thinking, um, I don't feel holy. That's not what I asked you. I asked you if you were holy. Do you know what makes me holy? Or should I say who makes me holy? Jesus Christ. And belief in Jesus Christ by the blood of Christ he has covered my sin, made me white as snow. You all sing that song. You all read the scriptures about how Jesus' blood has saved me from sin and covered everything in me. And so I look sinless to the creator God because of the blood of Jesus. So I look holy to God. So let me ask you again. How many of you are holy? I should say, if you're a believer in Christ, you should be raising your hand. You are holy. So I think when we talk about that big word holy or holiness, about pursuing a life of holiness, because we're not called just to be holy because of what Jesus did. Then he calls us to a life of holiness, to live a holy life. And I think we think that's an impossible task because we don't want to look holier than thou. You know what I mean? We don't want to be like, hey, I'm better than you. But we're going to talk about that today. That is the piece that we're going to talk about. And what's the amazing thing is you've heard the Apostle Paul talk about um, living the Christian life, uh, looking more like Jesus as a race, right? Remember Paul says you're running a race and you're going to get the prize. The awesome thing about that is that we already have a prize at the beginning of the race. We are holy. Now, none of you that's sitting in the blocks ready to run a race um, nobody's going to take the winning medal and put it over your neck, are they, until you run the race and finish the finish line. But that's not the way it is with God. He automatically makes us holy. What did I just talk about with these kids? How do we expect to have the Holy Spirit in us if we're not holy? Holy Spirit. Get it? Holy Spirit is in each believer by faith because of the blood of Christ. So we are holy. But I think a lot of us think that, I don't feel holy, and I don't know if I live a really holy life. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So, this is our last sermon in our series. Big words, big theological words that we throw around. Do we really know what they mean? Do we, you know, we sing about them, we pray about them. Do we really get down to the meat of them? So, a couple of weeks ago, we started this sermon series. This is the last sermon. We talked about salvation. We talked about atonement using golf clubs. Hey, whatever. I'll do whatever I can to make it stick in my head. Grace. We talked about grace, and you saw the video of the prodigal son. And today, we talk about holiness. Holiness. I remember when um, one of my friend's boys was young. He had jeans that had holes in it. And he would say, Mom, my jeans are holy. I can wear these to church, right? <laughs> so, a little bit different, but that's what we're going to talk about. Because you know what? The Hebrew writer writes this, Without holiness, no one will see God. Without holiness, no one will see God. Hmm. So holiness, being holy through the blood of Christ, and then pursuing a life of holiness is not just possible, it's a requirement for believers in Jesus Christ. So I'll ask you again, who's holy? Anybody out there holy? Hey! <laughs> Should I keep this on? What do you think? Okay, yes. I'm getting a yes from Kathy. All right, and that's all that matters. I'm going to keep it on. So let's talk about what the word holy means. And we're going to have to look at two scriptures. We're going to have to look at one in the Old Testament and one in the New Testament, because there was a different way that God made us holy in the Old and the New Testament. So let's start with by looking at Leviticus 19.2. God says to Moses, speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy. And then God says, 
For I, the Lord your God, am holy. So God says he's holy. What does that mean? That means God is pure. God is all truth. God is all light. There is no dark thought in God. There is no darkness in God. He doesn't have an evil thought. There is no sin in him. He, you can't compare him to anyone else because he's God. And he's holiness. It's who he is. But that's all I got. So luckily, I'm going to turn to some of the theologians from church history. And they're going to explain to you what God is. As holy means. So the first one is from Henry C. Thiessen. He writes, God is holy means that he is absolutely separate and exalted above all his creatures and creation. And he is entirely separate from all moral evil and sin. Now this doesn't mean that God doesn't know what's going on in our lives. That God hasn't sent us the Holy Spirit to guide us out of that evil or to get us away from that temptation. But he is still separate from that. And you say, how can we approach a holy God then? Because we're holy through faith in Christ. And that is the only way we look holy to God. That is the only way we can approach the throne boldly is because of the blood of Christ has made us holy. But we still are pursuing holiness. So it's not just that we are holy. We're going after, we're going after holiness, which is to look more like Jesus. Number two, theologian A.W. Tozer, holy is the way God is. To be holy, he does not conform to a standard. He is that standard. Because God is holy, all his attributes are holy. That is, whatever we think of as belonging to God must be thought of as holy. God has made holiness the moral condition necessary to the health of his universe. To the health of his universe. So, he's saying not only are we holy, but we're to pursue holiness because God has a purpose for us. And what is the purpose? What does Jesus command us to do? Go out and make disciples, right? And show that we're different. Show that we are filled with the Spirit of God by being different from the world. But we'll get into that in a minute. Last one, R.C. Sproul, which is the guy we're studying on Monday nights. Wow, this guy's mind-blowing. If you just listen to these theologians, you can sit there. I start taking notes, and I'm writing, and I'm writing, and then finally I put my pen down. I just sit there and go, wow. You know, their brains are just amazing to me. He writes this about God alone is holy in himself. The word holy is used as a synonym for his deity and calls attention to all that God is. It reminds us that God's love is holy love. His justice is holy justice. His mercy is holy mercy. His knowledge is holy knowledge. And his spirit is holy spirit. So just like all of us believe God is love, right? All of us believe God is just, right? Well, God is also holy. It's who he is. And so there's no comparison. Our standard for holiness should always be based on God himself. So that's a little bit about what God means when he says he's holy. I mean, a little bit, according to these theologians. I'm going to go with them because i got nothing else. So, now let's look at the part of the scripture that Peter quotes from. He says, Peter quotes, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Quotes that from Leviticus. That was what our scripture reading said today. So the Hebrew word for holy means, quote, Things belonging to God or something or someone set apart for God and God alone. The people of Israel were set apart to be and look and act differently than the other nations. The other ites, the Jebusites and the parasites. No, that's not. <laughs> I don't know, some ites that we learned right Bob, on Tuesday. There's many ites, Midianites and the blah, 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 Canaanites and all that. They were to... Be set apart. Holy means to be set apart for God and his purpose and his use. So the Israelites back in that day had all these laws and all these different Levitical commands. If you look in Leviticus and Deuteronomy and in Exodus, there's the Ten Commandments. But then there's all these other laws in Leviticus like, men, you should wear your dreadnels down the slope and don't get any longer than that. And you should grow your beard and never cut your hair and all these different things, right? And we think, that's weird. But God did that so that they would look different than the, than the Jebusites and the Canaanites and all those other nations. Because he said, you're mine. You belong to me. You are holy. So be holy. So how were they holy? They were set apart for God and they followed his law. That is how they were made holy. Now let's look at the New Testament. That was a Hebrew word, because the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. It was also rewritten in Greek, and that's called the Septuagint, so there's a big word for you. Have a nice day. Impress your friends with that. So in the New Testament, 
It's written in Greek. So holy or holiness means something similar to the Hebrew of holy, but slightly different. In the Greek, it means things that are made holy. We are made holy. Remember? I just talked about that. We are made holy in and through the blood of Christ. We are made holy. But we're also set apart to go out into the world and look different than the world. And I think that's the problem with the church is we don't look any different than anybody else. And I think that's why the church is dwindling. We can blame it on people have to do this on Sunday. People have to do that on Sunday. Then they have church on Wednesday. You know, people work on Sundays. Sometimes they can't get to church. But we are holy and made holy by the work of Christ, by the blood of Christ. No longer are we sacrificing goats on the altar, right? Because Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. Jesus is a perfect blood sacrifice. So that's what makes us holy. But we're also set apart from others, and we should look different. We should be in the world, but we shouldn't be of the world. We should be in the world for the world. And so 2 Timothy 1.9. Who wrote the book of Timothy? Quick. Paul. Oh, very good. So Paul says, he has saved us, God, and called us to holy life. Not because of anything we have done, only through the blood of Christ are we holy, but because of his own purpose and his grace. So remember we talked about grace? When you receive the gift of salvation by grace, that's a gift given to God. You don't have to work for it, remember? You also receive holiness. You receive the Holy Spirit. Boom, right then, you're holy. You are holy. You are holy. You are holy. Okay? But then we're called to live a holy life because God has a purpose for us. So let's talk about Jesus and how he makes us holy. We talked about him making us holy through his blood, right? Theologians call this positional holiness, okay? It's positional holiness. His blood purifies our sins. He washes us white as snow. He redeems us from sin and death. And so therefore we stand in the position of holiness through faith in Christ and what he has done. So you are holy. And I don't think we think about that. We think, oh, I should, you know, I shouldn't say I'm holy because that's going to make me look condescending to others because I'm going to look holier than thou. Uh, listen, baby, I'm holy, and there ain't nothing you can do about it. <laughs> I didn't say I was perfect, and we're going to get into that. But I'm holy because of what Jesus did. So holy is what we are. I stand in the position of holiness only through the gift of grace and what Jesus has done and because of the blood of Christ. We sing about the blood of Christ. There's a million hymns about the blood of Christ, and it sounds like this bloody mess. No, this is what he's done. His blood has made us white as snow. His blood has made us clean. So when God looks at us, he looks at us through Jesus' righteousness, Jesus' perfection, and he sees us as holy. Because where God is, sin can't be. So how can we approach a holy God? Only through the blood of Christ. So, positional holiness. Okay? We have been made holy through Christ. And you know what? We need to rejoice about that. We need to celebrate about that. Have you ever thought about that? You know, we think about being forgiven. And we think about not going to hell. And we think about life in eternal living with God. And we think about all these things. But do we think that we are holy? Do we believe that to be true? Because it's true. Positionally, we are holy by the work of Christ and the blood of Christ. But we're not only made holy, we are called to holy living. Apostle Paul confirms this in Ephesians 1.4. He writes, For God chose us in Christ before the creation of the world to be holy through Christ. That's how God chose us through Christ, to be holy and blameless in his sight and to live a holy life. Now, does holiness mean we're sinless and perfect? Nope. I'm sure I sinned already today. Somehow, some way. And you know, that means just like Jesus said, if you ever thought something bad about somebody, eh, like you've already murdered them. Holy smokes. So we know that we're not holy. We're holy, but we're not completely, perfectly holy. So let me give you another theologian. I don't have him up on the screen, but theologian Charles Spurgeon. Yeah, amazing, amazing. Yes, he was a Baptist, but an amazing church father. I mean, just an amazing preacher. And so he, he talks about God creating day and night. Okay, aren't we doing that for Sunday school? God created day and night, and together he called them day. Remember that? Got to go back to you. Got to dust off your Sunday school hats. 
So God created day and night, and together he called them day. So in day, there's both light and dark, right? There's lightness and darkness. In broken human beings, because we live in a fallen world, there's both lightness and darkness. And the lightness is the holiness that God gives us. But we also have darkness in us because we live in a broken world. This is what he writes. Spurgeon writes, you, he's talking about you and me, like the day, take not your name from the night, but from the morning, because you are spoken of in the word of God as if you were even now perfectly holy, as you will soon be. Eternity. Get it? So we are perfectly holy in the eyes of God because he can't, he can't even have a conversation with us because we are filled with darkness. Okay, because we're still light, but we're also darkness. And he can't, he can't even listen to our prayers or come near us or anything without the work of Christ on the cross. Holy. <coughs> As we will soon be perfectly holy in eternity. And in the meantime, what do we do? We're agreeing to run the race, to pursue holiness. To work out our salvation. These are the, some things that Paul throws around. What he's talking about is we're working towards that goal of being perfectly holy. And who is perfectly holy? Jesus. Jesus is perfectly holy. So you're probably thinking, how do I live a life of holiness? I'm thinking that. So how do I do it? How do I do that? This is where we go to our scripture reading from Peter. First Peter. He says, be obedient children. Be obedient, right? Pursuing a life of holiness means we're obedient. We obey God's word and we do what he tells us to do. And if we don't, it'll take you four or five years to become a pastor like it did me. Because I was like, la, 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 la. My poor husband, I tell him, can I get out of this anyway? <laughs> I would like to just stop and do something different. Maybe go work at Walmart. <laughs> You know, I tried that already. Tried to go back into what I used to do. And God says, hey, nope. Nope. I'm like, dang it. So whatever he's calling you to do, know that you're going to have to do it. It might take you 20 years to do it, but he's going to call you to do it. And I laugh at one of my lovely leaders who says, I'm never going to Africa. <laughs> we might be heading to Africa when we retire. Look at me. No. I will be sicker than a dog. But whatever, we'll go. You'll have to hold my hand. My puke bucket. So... Be obedient children. That's one way we live a life of holiness or pursue holiness. Remember how I talked about lassoing your thoughts and bringing them under the authority of Christ? We have to measure everything we think and everything we do about what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do in this situation? Would he react? You know, I hear people say, I, should, I would have said this or I would have said that. And I said, I didn't say anything. I just sat there and went, no, I thought, no. Because for me, sometimes that's the best thing. Because if I say something, I'm probably going to win that argument. <laughs> or give it a darn good try. Anybody out there like to win arguments? None of you? Good. <laughs> Only Denise and I. Good. That's right. So first thing, be obedient. Second, Peter tells us to pursue a holy life by not slipping back into our old ways before we were believers. He says, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. <laughs> Peter. This is Peter. Remember, he was the one that just said what he thought. And this is so when you read the book, first and second letters of Peter, he's pretty much black and white, isn't he? He's like, boom, boom, boom. That's what you do. So he said, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. And what helps us with that? We're supposed to look different. What helps us with not falling back into those ways that we were before we knew Christ? I don't know about you, but I'll tell you a mean thing I used to do. It was really bad. I don't even want to tell you. <laughs> really? Okay. So, you're going to think, this isn't so bad. Well, I would sit there with my friends, and we'd go out to the bar after we worked at, I worked at a TV station for many years, and we'd be drinking whatever, and We'd look around, and I, we'd all say, it was all girls, all women. Women, you'll know this. It was like, oh, my gosh, can you believe she's got that on? Ah, why would she ever walk out like that? What she's wearing. I mean, we would just rip people to shreds. You know, that just shows insecurity, right? That's all that shows. But that's what we would do. You know, or I've told you before, I'd go out with my sisters, and we'd have a bad meal, and they demanded that I get them a free meal. And I would I would, I would nail that waitress and that waiter, and I'd get all the way up to the general manager, and we would get something off that meal. 
I, I don't do that anymore. I'm just happy I got a meal. I'm just happy somebody cooked for me. You know? And I don't know about you, but when you're 28, like I was, I was like cocky, thinking, I'm great, I know everything. I look good. <laughs> now that, you know, the wrinkles, how am I going to cover up these wrinkles for the camera? And it always adds 10 pounds. So we're not perfect. We're not sinless. But we need, we need to not backslide. When I start acting that way, the spirit will catch me and go, what are you doing? And for some of us, it's a knock upside the head with, right, two by four. Two by four. What are you doing? So we were different before we knew Christ. Amen? Yes. So Peter's like, don't go back to that. Pursue holiness. When you want to go back to that, pray to God. Pray to the Spirit to bring you back from that way of living. And last but not least, to pursue a life of holiness, we have to make Jesus our standard for holiness. I don't know about you, but I can compare myself to other people. I can say, well, you know, I go to church every Sunday. I have to. It's my job. <laughs> I go to church when I'm on vacation Or I watch it <laughs> But I go to church every, every Sunday So I can compare myself to somebody who doesn't And go, well I'm holier than they are That's where we get the holier than thou attitude Right? Oh my gosh, can you believe she cusses like a, a sailor? And she's supposed to be X, Y, and Z Or can you believe he's Working on Sunday instead of going to church or blah, blah, blah. That's holier than thou. And that's what I think the world sees when they look at church people. Instead of, yeah, I cuss. I had a friend who was a pastor. She goes, I like to cuss. <laughs> I said, aren't you afraid it's going to come out in the pulpit? And she goes, yeah, sometimes I'm la la and then I go on to the next one. <laughs> She's so funny. But she goes, that's something i got to work on with the Spirit, you know? So our standard is Jesus for holiness. If we look at anything else or anyone else or any, any, anybody else living a life trying to pursue holiness, if we compare ourselves to them, we will always look good. Because we're always going to compare ourselves to people that don't look as good. Let's compare ourselves to Mother Teresa! <laughs> oh! And even that, she's not the standard of holiness. God is the standard of holiness. Christ is the standard of holiness. So we love like Christ. And we're compassionate like Christ. And we're going to sacrifice like Christ. So when I ask you to stuff eggs, stuff the eggs. Thank you very much, by the way. You guys are doing great stuffing eggs. Right? We serve. We serve. And sometimes it takes our money and our time. But that's what Jesus did. For Pete's sakes, he went out and lived on dirt and rocks and didn't slept on a rock also, he could spread the good news and teach these 12 guys how to be in the church. And they were clueless most of the time. They were clueless most of the time. So our standard is always Jesus. And you might be thinking, you know what? I still don't feel very holy. And I don't think I can pursue holiness. I just feel like I fail all the time. Then be reminded of what the Apostle Peter says in verse 13, which I did not read for you, but I will. He says, therefore, therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. We need to set our minds and our actions and our thoughts and things that come out of our mouths on Christ and what he has given us and what he has paid to make us holy. Peter writes in verse 18, never forget what has made you holy. He says, you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. So we are holy. We need to start acting like it, right? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning, and we thank you that in and through your blood, on the cross, what you've done for us, you have made us holy, pure, sinless in the eyes of God. Because without holiness, we can never see God. And what that means is that you've made a way for us to approach a holy God through your blood. But then you call us to continue to live a holy life because we're supposed to look different from the world so they can say, what do you got that I don't have? We have the Holy Spirit. Yes, we make mistakes. And yes, we still have that dark side of us. But we're moving on to that perfect holiness that we will receive upon our death or when you return. 
And we thank you, Lord, that we should never take for granted your blood that saved us and made us holy. May we always pursue a holy life. In the name of Christ, amen. So that's the end of our series on big words. Yeah. So let's see, what are we going to do next? How about joys, prayers of joys and concerns? So we're going to go ahead and type out your prayers. We'll check them on Monday, or yeah, Monday, and we'll send them out to our prayer list. Denise. I got my daughter here and Mitch, and they are engaged. Haley and Mitch are engaged. Let's give them a round of applause. Colorado oh. in 13 days, 12 days. So. Okay, moving out to Colorado. So um, blessings on your uh, nuptials as they will happen, I'm sure, what, in a year or so, because it takes forever to get married, doesn't it? I mean, They're unless different. you elope to Hawaii, which is what I would like one of my daughters. I want to go to Hawaii. I'm <laughs> <laughs> in Colorado somewhere. They're doing an elopement. Woohoo! All right. So um, before I end, we'll say a blessing on Mitch and Haley just for um, their. Uh, their soon-to-be wedding and their life together and their new life in Colorado, so that's wonderful. Thank you, Proud Mom and Dad. Mm -hmm. um, any other groups? Bob? Yeah, my sister Jenny for help and my sister Linda for just grief. So Linda for grief and Jenny for health. I want to thank everyone for prayers for our, our uh, dog, Paisley. She had surgery and she's doing well. Paisley's doing well, so yay. Mm -hmm. So that's good. That's uh, Steve and Heather's dog, so we prayed for them. You know, there was a lady that put on um, a, something about she took her dog in and had an intestinal thing. Anyway, I normally just blow those things off, but I didn't this time. I don't know why. God just said, help. So I did, and then it turns around, and she needs more help. So I'm just like, ay, 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 I hope that they can save this dog. So I think that, what's the dog's name? I can't remember what the dog's name is, but pray for this lady with her dog because she just can't afford to, um, you know, get the second procedure because it's so expensive. We need health insurance for our dogs. Um, other prayers? F? I want to thank God and my church for helping me through everything I've been through. I'm very proud of myself. I grow for the first time since the accident. But I was in a position to help JD where I had to. Yeah. I did it. And from then on, I knew I could do this. Yeah. Hopefully, JB gave you permission, eh? Did you call JB and tell him you were driving to church? <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, praise God she made it here safe. Let's pray she gets home safe. If I have to drive you home, I will. All right. Jamie. I love what you would say for my sister. For your sister? And my baby daughter, Amber. For Amber? My animals. Sister's animals. animals. Oh, sister's animals. Thank you. Okay, good. Yes, we will pray. Other prayers. Zena. Uh, I'd like prayers for Ralph. He's he's getting a little bit uncomfortable. He's put a little weight on. His pants don't fit anymore around the waist. I think we can all relate to that. He doesn't do anything anymore. But yeah. He's not walking. I haven't seen him walking. No, that hasn't been good because he slips you know, and falls. Okay. Uh, but he will go. He's yeah. stubborn, so when he wants to, he will go. But I'd like also for us for me to handle it. Okay, <laughs> so for Ralph and for Zita to handle Ralph. Okay. Yes, and then he lets me. Yeah, <laughs> all our caregivers, that's difficult. Other prayers, Connie? Um, uh, my sister-in-law, Don Pace. Okay, Don Pace for health, thank you. Chum? For Barb Radcliffe, we have tests tomorrow. Barb Radcliffe for tests, okay. Yeah, Kenny? Uh, prayers for a young lady named Charlie, who is in the hospital in Phoenix with some neurological issues. Okay, Charlie for There's neurological issues. Yeah. Okay, for healing for that. Chum? Dan Walton for surgery tomorrow. Yeah, Dan has hip surgery tomorrow, so we'll pray for him. I don't know what time, but just keep him in your prayers. Do you so, have the, the church is the way the world is going today. Is for, the, uh, for the church? Yep. Thank yeah. you for our military. For our military? First responders and our border patrol. First responders and our border patrol. Thank you. Other prayers? Jane. I'd like prayers for my brother, Bob, who lives in Texas with his wife and their in their late 80s, and they finally have electricity again, but still have no water. Okay, so Bob and his wife have no water, and I heard it was getting warmer finally there. It's getting warmer. 
Okay. The snow is left. All right. So for Texas, Ellie. For Ron and Donna, the loss of her dad. Yeah, for Ron and Donna, for the loss of um, Donna's dad, Lee. So um, we want to pray for her. Denise. The Donna Weber family. The Donna Weber family. Okay. <laughs> Other prayers. Marsha. Um, for Dennis and Diane Brown um, and their son Mike, who continues to, you know, go through therapy and everything. For so, okay, so for Mike, for continued therapy, and Dennis and Donna, his parents, who are, are the caregivers. Caregivers. And unspoken. And unspoken, thank you. Anything else? Dale. For Don Cotton's family, Calcasta. Don Cotton family? Don Cotton's family. Okay, thank you. If, if you ever eat a potato chip, have I ever eaten a potato chip? <laughs> I love potato chips. <laughs> That's my big problem. Yeah, Cindy. Unspoken. Unspoken. Yes, and <laughs> for rich and continued uh, tests. For rich for continued tests. Anything else? Yeah. So, um, joy for your sledding party. Yeah, we had fun. Yeah. Nobody broke anything, so praise the Lord. And youth, we are not going to be ice skating because I don't think we're going to have ice. <laughs> so, is that shut down, Jeff? It's pretty much done. It's pretty much done. Okay, so we'll have to think of something else. Maybe a movie. Who knows? We'll do something. Joanne. Party plater. Party plater for health. Okay. Anything else? All those with COVID. COVID, yep. Marsha Cole for health. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have no Unspoken. Thank you. Anything else? All right. Let's pray and we'll end with the Lord's Prayer. It'll be up on the screen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the prayers of your people. You have heard many, and I know there are others that have not been spoken aloud, so we just give you thanks for them. That you hear them. We thank you that by the blood of Christ we can enter this throne room and approach you because we are made holy because of Christ. And so, Lord, continue to guide us through your spirit as we pursue this thing called holy living. Not perfect, but trying to be different, trying to be like Jesus in a world that so desperately needs to see Jesus in us. And, Lord, we do pray for those that are suffering with cancer. We pray for those treatments that they will be helpful and useful and soon make them cancer-free. We pray for those with COVID. Um, it's still out there and... I just am thankful that um, a lot of this congregation was able to get some vaccines if they chose to do that. And so we thank you for that. We thank you for being with us, hearing our prayers, and for teaching us to pray. Saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So now is the time that we would normally do the offering. The offering plates are in the back, so if you're feeling moved to give, those go towards ministries in the church. And we're going to go ahead and pray for our offering now. So join me in the offertory prayer. Dear God, we praise your almighty name. You have blessed our nation with immense wealth and opportunity. You have commanded us to honor you with our wealth, and I pray that you will be honored greatly this day as we give to you what is already yours. Bless these cheerful givers and bless the tithes and offerings that they give. Amen. All right, let's stand and sing. <coughs>
uh, starting today and next Sunday, we're going to start having coffee before and after the service. And it's all, the tables are all set up, so we're slowly getting back. And there's a bunch of sports down there. Sign up for the high school sports. Middle school would love that. And then the rest of the stuff you can read, but we got some upcoming events. So you ready over there? Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. You've got to be in two places at once. So, yeah, let's do it our own duty.